title of this sermon tonight is Don't Play the Fool with God. Many have. Many have. Don't play the fool with God. I have played the fool. I have played the fool and have erred exceedingly. 1 Samuel 26 verse 21. The tragic words of Saul. The tragic words of Saul. Who was anointed Israel's first king. In 1050 BC. But died in shame. 40 years later. In 1010 BC. After Moses' death. Joshua led God's people across the Jordan River into the promised land. And after Joshua's death, God ordained judges over his people until the godly Samuel. Then we read in 1 Samuel 8 verse 1, it came to pass when Samuel was old that he made his sons. He made his sons judges over Israel but his sons walked not in his ways, verse 3 says. His sons walked not in his ways, but turned aside after lucre, that's dishonest gain financially. And they took bribes and perverted the judgment. Verse 4, then all the elders of Israel said unto him, Behold, thou art old, and thy sons, thy sons walk not in thy ways, now make us a king. Make us a king to judge us like all other nations. Verse 6, but the thing displeased Samuel when they said, give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed unto the Lord. Verse 7, and the Lord said unto Samuel, hearken unto the voice of the people. In all that they say unto thee, for they have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. Staggering. Why would God choose such a man as Saul, who brought nothing but sorrow and shame and tragedy and suffering upon that land? Some people have said to me, well, it was not God's will and his grief at their choosing a man. He gave them a man that would show them how wrong they were in rejecting his leadership. I disagree. I disagree with that. I believe that God chose a man that he honestly hoped would lead his people with integrity, who would fear him and obey his commandments. But Saul tragically brought nothing but grief and shame and fear on the nation. It's almost as if the pages of the sacred book are rent with grief as they record his foolish choices that he made in his life and their tragic consequences. I believe that this agonizing record of this tragic life of Israel's first king is a grave and compassionate warning from God to us all, to us all, to take careful heed that the eventual record, the eventual record of our lives may not also be written with grief and shame. that we would seek the Lord with all of our hearts. Jeremiah 29 verse 13 says, in sincerity and truth, 1 Corinthians 5 verse 8, and not to stoop and play the fool. 
played a fool with God. We read in 1 Samuel 15 verse 2 that Saul was chosen by God to be Israel's first king when he was little in his own sight. 1 Samuel 26 verse 21. Staggering words here. When he was little in his own sight. And this book is strewn with this teaching and this warning. Strewn from beginning to end. But before honor, any honor from God is humility. Proverbs 15 verse 33. Before honor is humility. And I say to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. Romans 12 verse 3. Saul was chosen by God when he was little in his own sight. He hid himself among the stuff. 1 Samuel 1 verse 22 records. He hid himself when he realized that they sought to make him their king. This this was one of the things that immediately endeared him to all the people and made him the desire that is the delight of all Israel. 1 Samuel 9.20 records, But as we fast forward across the fearful pages of the sacred book, we read of one of the greatest tragedies in all biblical history. For the Lord soon repented that is, he regretted that he had made Saul king over his people. 1 Samuel 15 verse 35. It repenteth me that I have set up Saul to be king. He declared in verse 11. For he is turned back from following me. He is turned back from following me. And God has tragically said those words of many other people through the ages. Perhaps even of someone sitting here in this meeting tonight. But how is it possible that all this tragedy could have happened to Saul so swiftly after God chose him? How does one preach meaningfully on the life of Saul? Unless one looks at everything that happened to him carefully and prayerfully in the light of the rest of the scriptures, especially the New Testament. It's the only way to read this book to understand the heart of God in truth. We must remember, we must remember that the Lord spoke of those that Hear the word of God like you are tonight. But then he carefully warned us in the next verse, then cometh the devil. Luke 8 verse 11, Satan, Satan cometh immediately, Jesus said. Mark 4 verse 15, and taketh away the word out of their hearts. Beloved, Satan is able to do that. Don't doubt this, or Christ would never have said it. We dare not underestimate his power. He walketh about as a roaring lion. 1 Peter 5 verse 8 warns from going to and fro in the earth, walking up and down in it. Job 1 verse 7, seeking whom he may devour. He's doing it right now. Don't doubt it. And Christ went on to warn us in Luke 8 verse 13 of those who when they hear, when they hear God's word, they receive it with joy, with joy. Have you, at some point in your life, with gladness, Mark 4 verse 16 says. But, Jesus goes on, these have no root. Which for a while believe, that is, which dureth for a while. Mark 13 verse 21 says, 
But in time of temptation, literally of testing, they fall away. Fearful words here. And Satan took everything. Satan took everything out of the heart of this tragic man, everything that God and man had initially seen in him and had honored him for. Can Satan do that? Oh, yes. Otherwise, this wouldn't be in the Bible. Satan took everything God and man had initially seen in him and honored him for. And the godly prophet Samuel fearfully told him, but God now sought another king. For the Lord hath sought him a man after his own heart, Samuel said. Chapter 13, verse 14. And God, of course, found David, whose heart proved to be perfect with the Lord. 1 Kings 15, verse 3 records. Whose heart proved to be perfect with the Lord. And we read in verse 5 that David did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord and turned not aside as Saul did from anything that God commanded him all the days of his life, save only apart from the matter of Uriah the Hittite. We also read that Samuel mourned for Saul. Verse 5 records, Samuel mourned for Saul. He cried unto God for him. The whole night. Now those words raised Samuel to a different level of godliness than others. Yes, he had rebuked Saul with fearful gravity, but with a broken heart. And we all need to take heed here, especially preachers. If your harshest word of judgment against those who fall does not throb with God's love. In and out of the pulpit, preacher, your sin is greater than those you're condemning. Don't doubt this now. Not only preachers. But Samuel mourned for Saul. 1 Samuel 15 verse 35 says, For it grieved Samuel, and he cried unto the Lord all the night. Verse 11 records, Until, until the Lord said, how long wilt thou mourn for Saul? Chapter 16, verse 1. Now in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul also experienced great sorrow and grief as Samuel had over such tragic men whom he also at first had great joy and expectation in but eventually wept and mourned over. He sadly wrote in Philippians 3 verse 18, For many walk, of whom I have told you often, but now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. Many walk, of whom I have often told you, but now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. Can Satan do that to you? Really? You think this is just some play for a little record of a man that doesn't mean God's cry to you and my heart? There's nothing in this book that isn't God's cry to you and my heart, sir. Get through it 400 times. There's not a verse that isn't vital to an old God's heart. Many walk of whom I have often told you, but now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. And beloved, brace yourselves. Brace yourselves, for you also will grieve over souls who at first you delighted in spiritually in your lifetime and ministry. You also will grieve over souls who at first you delighted in spiritually. Clouds they are without water. Trees whose fruit withereth swiftly dies. Without fruit, that's genuine fruit. Twice dead, Jude, verse 12. That's tragic. Dead, you think there's life? Dead, Jude, verse 12. Tragic and fearful words here. Tragic and fearful words. So the first 
The first fearful warning given to us through this record in God's word of Saul's tragic life is that many who we delight in today may soon cause us to mourn and even weep as Samuel and Paul eventually did. But this first warning has two facets to consider prayerfully. For there are those perhaps even sitting in this meeting here tonight who may indeed have received God's word. may have received God's word to their hearts like Saul at first did with joy but who eventually tragically We urgently need to take heed of Christ's fearful warning here. All of us. Then cometh the devil. Do you think that's just something for you to read, sir? You don't think Satan will come even after this message within moments or even during it? Jesus' words that don't have any meaning from God's heart to warn you. Be careful what you do with this message tonight, friend. If you sense that God is addressing and warning you right now in love, you be careful what you do with this message. Or you may also one day, sadly, as Saul tragically did, you may one day, sadly, cry, God is departed from me. God is departed from me. And answereth me no more. He no longer speaks to me. 1 Samuel 28 verse 15. I once heard the testimony of a very great preacher in your country who I had the privilege of sitting with for a little while and praying with. You will all know his name. He said as a boy, he grew up in a God-fearing home, and his father was a godly, conservative, evangelical preacher, faithful. But he said as a boy, he chose sin. He chose sin and the wrong friends. He chose, he sought them out. sought them out but God continued to speak to his heart every time he sat under his father's ministry and other faithful preachers in conferences in church services God spoke to his heart again and again until one night in some convention he said he sat there and there was a total deadness <laughs> It had never happened. Deadness. It was like dead to the word of God. And as he felt this deadness, he said he began to tremble. And he thought, could it be God's given up on me? Could it be God's not going to speak to me anymore? I chose to reject his word. He said that he left that meeting with this fearful verse echoing in his mind as he trembled and he didn't want to speak to his friends or anyone. He that hardeneth his heart, being often reproved, shall suddenly be destroyed, and that without remedy. Terrible verse, that. You think it's there to play the fool with? Be careful. Be careful here. He 
He said, as he fearfully writhed in agony and fear, right through that night, he began to cry out to God, weeping. He couldn't sleep. He's got in his face crying, please, God, don't. I've hardened my heart over and over again, walked out as you've spoken to me. Don't let me be destroyed without remedy for doing that folly. And as he agonized, suddenly he said, he looked to the blood of Christ in such desperation as his only hope. And suddenly he said, it was as if a wave of divine love swept over him. It was not mind over matter, for he was in agony. All he could do is worship God. For the first time in his life, he was worshipped. And peace flooded his heart. And that boy rose up to become a preacher, a great preacher in your country, of whom I think every one of you, I doubt anyone would not have heard of his name, and to preach uncompromising truth fervently. And ye shall seek me, and ye shall find me, when you shall search for me with all your heart. And I will be found of you, yes, I will be found of you. If you shall seek me with all your heart, I will be found of you, yes, I will be found of you, when you shall seek me. With all your heart. Jeremiah 29 verse 13 promises. So why don't you give him first place in your heart? Shun all the wrong and from sin now depart. You'll find happiness right from the start if you give him first place in your heart. But, but let us all be careful here, beloved, for this verse that wrought such fear in that young man's heart is staggering. He that being often reproved, yet hardeneth his neck, shall suddenly be destroyed. And that without remedy. You're dealing with the holy God here. Does that not put fear in your heart? Proverbs 29, verse 1. Harden not your heart. Proverbs Psalm 95, verse 8 warns, For my spirit shall not always strive with a man. Genesis 6, verse 3. Woe unto him. Woe unto him that striveth with his maker. Isaiah 45, verse 9 warns. These are fearful warnings, friends strewn across the pages of God's sacred book that we dare not take lightly. We dare not take lightly. But let us return now to Saul, for we also need to take careful time to consider one of the greatest tragedies doctrinally and confusions and fearful question marks over God's righteousness that has risen over the centuries through his seemingly merciless dealings with Saul. Many have staggered at and seriously questioned God's merciless judgment upon him. But we dare not allow ourselves to doubt God's righteousness, beloved. Not only toward Saul, but toward every soul in history. 
even Pharaoh, even Esau. You look back to the context of where these verses in Romans 9 are and you'll find there's a reason. There's always reason. No man will stand before God and say, I had no choice. Let me tell you something. For this cause, Roman 1 said, for this cause God gave them up. Even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things that are not convenient. Oh, there's always a cause uh, right in the book of Romans in case you want me to go and read Romans 9 before I've read Romans 1. I won't understand Romans 9. We dare not allow ourselves to doubt God's righteousness, beloved, not only toward Saul, but toward every soul in history. And preachers, always be careful to defend God's integrity and righteousness toward all men, or you miss the mark and become heretic doctrinally if you don't. Don't defend a doctrine, sir. Defend God's righteousness and man's responsibility. Or get out of the pulpit, for God's sake. And for the souls you preach to a sake, but especially for your own sake. In the light of this book's warning to preachers. Even when we don't understand his dealings with individuals, we must never question or doubt his perfect righteousness. Never! Many people have questioned God's righteousness as they consider the widespread suffering of innocent people across this sorrowful world. And I don't pretend to have all the answers, but I always point them to the cross of Christ, who was God manifest in the flesh as the staggering proof of his uncomprehendable love and compassion toward all men. Toward all men. I've got nothing else to point to, but it silences everyone. He gave his only begotten son, John 3, verse 16 tells us, and will have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Who gave himself a ransom for all, 1 Timothy 2, verse 4. God is not unrighteous, Hebrews 6, verse 10. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? Genesis 18, verse 25. He will judge the world in righteousness. Acts 17, verse 3. For thine eyes are open unto all the ways of the sons of men to give them according to their ways. Jeremiah 32, verse 19. I don't doubt God's righteousness, but at this point, at this point, I want us to skim across the pages of this sacred book to look at later kings of Israel and of Judah. And as God's merciful and righteous dealings with these kings. Many of whom were also tragic failures. And fearfully wicked. But who turned in genuine repentance before the end of their lives. And sought God with all their hearts. And as a result were forgiven and even honored by God and man. We read in 1 Kings 16.33 that Ahab did more to provoke the Lord to anger than all the kings of Israel that were before him. That's including Saul. Including Saul. He did more to provoke the Lord to anger than all the kings. There was none like unto Ahab who did sell himself to wickedness in the sight of God. 1 Kings 21 verse 55 records... He was abominable, God says. God's wrath and merciless judgment was declared against him. But it came to pass, verse 27, when Ahab heard of God's anger, that he rent his clothes and he put on sackcloth upon his flesh and he fasted. He lay on the ground in sackcloth and went softly he went about mourning, literally grieving. Verse 28, And the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, Seest thou how Ahab humbleth himself before me? Wherefore, because he humbles himself before me, I will not bring judgment upon him in his days. Isn't that amazing? That men that did more wickedness than Saul, all God wanted, 
but for them to seek him in truth. In 2 Kings 13 verse 1, King Jehoahaz also did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. Verse 3, and when the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel and against Jehoahaz, he besought the Lord in such a way that the Lord also hearkened unto him and the Lord gave Israel a saviour. A lovely story altogether how God turned all the judgment that was coming upon them. And that man sought God, that wicked man. 2 Chronicles 27, 1, Jotham began to reign. Verse 2, how be it, but he entered not into the temple of the Lord. Speaks volumes. And the people did yet corruptly under his leadership. They continued to pursue their sin. But then we read in verse 6 that Jotham became mighty. Because he prepared his ways before the Lord at some point. To him that ordereth his conversation, his life aright. Will I show the salvation of God? Psalm 50 verse 23 tells us. But Psalm 55 19 warns us all because they have no changes. Therefore, they fear not. I want to repeat that because they won't change. Turn. They do not fear me, God says. Psalm 55, verse 19. Staggering words, this. Hebrews 6, verse 9 speaks of things that accompany salvation. One of the most important verses in the Bible that people just overlook. There are things that accompany salvation that are vital. Hebrews 6, verse 9. Beginning with the foundation of repentance. Hebrews 6 verse 1. So repent. Turn to God and do works. Meet for repentance. Acts 26 verse 20. Let every one that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Or stop naming him. Don't ever name him again. The devil will use you. Don't you think you're going to get away with it and you'll bring blaspheme in God's name if you are regarded as religious and true? Let every one that name with the name of Christ depart from iniquity. 2 Timothy 2 verse 19. Things that accompany salvation. Repent and turn yourselves from all your transgressions so iniquity shall not be your ruin. Ezekiel 18 verse 30. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord and he will have mercy upon him. Isaiah 55 verse 7. Therefore turn to the Lord for he is gracious and merciful. Joel 2 verse 13 records. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift you up. He promises that. James 4 verse 10. He promises that. Humble thyself to walk with thy God. Don't just humble thyself. What's good? Uh, humble thyself in a way that your life turns and you walk with God. Micah 6 tells us. You have to humble yourselves in that way. As Ahab did. Jehoaz, all these men. But so didn't. So didn't. But why then, many ask, was God so merciless upon Saul? Well, I believe a holy God looked and saw when no other man can or ever will be able to. I believe God looked into Saul's heart with great grief. And this is a fearful warning to all of us here tonight. For by him actions are weighed. 1 Samuel 2 verse 3. Thou art the Lord God who did choose Abraham and found us his heart faithful before thee and made us a covenant with him. Nehemiah 9 verse 8. For I the Lord search the heart. I try that test the reins, the mind, the inner agenda of a man, his thoughts. Jeremiah 17 verse 10. To give every man, not just Saul, according to his ways, according to the fruit of his deeds. And God has sadly found in many men, 
even deeply religious men. But the heart is deceitful above all things, desperately wicked. Who can know it? Jeremiah 17 verse 9 warns, God trieth our hearts, friend. 1 Thessalonians 2 verse 4 said, God trieth the hearts. All of our hearts, he looks at right now as we sit here on his word. With all our religion, God sees your heart. That's fearful. That's fearful. He searcheth the hearts, Romans 8 verse 27. He knoweth the secrets of the heart, Psalm 44 verse 21. All things are naked and open to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Hebrews 4 verse 13. You see, the word of God is a discerner of the thoughts, the intents of the heart, its motives, its intentions, its agenda, Hebrews 4 verse 12. And if our heart condemn us here tonight, if our heart condemn us here tonight, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. 1 John 3 verse 20, does your heart condemn you as you sit here tonight? Under his word, fully stop, not me, not under me, but under God's word, just God's word. Does your heart condemn you? God is greater than your heart and knoweth all things. Jeremiah prayed, Thou, O Lord, knowest me and hast tried my heart. In chapter 12, verse 3. My friend, uh, perhaps at this point of your life you also need to pray. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. See if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting while there's hope. Psalm 139 verse 23. When God sent Samuel to anoint David to be king, he told him that he looketh at the heart, not as man looketh. 1 Samuel 16 verse 7. David prayed, thou hast proved, that is tried, tested my heart. Thou hast tried me and found nothing evil. Psalm 17, verse 3. Can you say that to God tonight? Beloved, we must not doubt that as God looked into Saul's heart, as God looked into Saul's heart, he saw rebellion, the Bible says, that was as evil in his eyes as witchcraft. 1 Samuel 15, verse 23, records stubbornness, fearful stubbornness that was as evil as idolatry. Verse 23 records, God looked at this man's heart and saw wickedness. So the second lesson we must learn from the life of Saul in the light of all scripture is that we dare not question God's righteousness in his dealings with any soul, even yours. But also that he sees into the hearts what we do not see. And he fearfully warns us that there's nothing covered that shall not be revealed. Nothing hid that shall not be made known. That's fearful. What do you think people don't know about you? One moment, that's all you've got, that's life. One moment, this moment called life. It's gone in a moment. There's nothing covered that shall not be revealed, God promises, or hid that shall not be made known in Matthew 10, verse 26. Some men's sins are open beforehand. Clearly, evidently, going before to judgment. But some men, they follow after. 1 Timothy 5, verse 24. You can cover it right now, but it's not for long, and every single sin in your life and hypocrisy and lie will be shouted from the mountaintops to every soul that knows you. You just have a moment to lie in religion. But be sure of this. He that doeth wrong, shall, he that doeth wrong, shall receive for the wrong which he hath done, for there's no respect of persons with God. Policy in C verse 25. Now we read in 1 Samuel 15 verse 3 that God, God commanded Saul, go and smite Amalek 
and utterly destroy all that they have, but slay, slay both man and woman, infant and suckling, ox and sheep, camel and ass. Here God commanded Saul to destroy the gravely evil people of Amalek and everything they possessed, even their livestock, tragically strongly referring to the dark depravity of bestiality which God condemned in Leviticus 18, verse 23 and 24, that if anyone did that, they have to be put to death. This was nothing new. 1 Samuel 15, verse 9, but Saul defiantly spared Agag, their king, and most of the livestock. That's their animals. This was in total defiance of God's commandments to him. 1 Samuel 15, verse 13, And when Saul, when Samuel came to Saul, Saul said unto him, Blessed be thou of the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. And Samuel said, But then what meaneth this bleating of sheep in mine ears? The lowing of the oxen which I hear. Verse 20, And Saul said to Samuel, but I have obeyed the Lord. I have obeyed the Lord. And how many to this day, beloved, like Saul, claim to serve God faithfully. But the world cries back in disbelief as Samuel did. What meaneth this bleating of sheep? Eli, the godly high priest, heard all that his evil sons did. 1 Samuel 2, verse 22. Who shamefully ministered in the priesthood while they committed open evil sin and wickedness. And Eli said to his sons, I hear, I hear of all your evil doings by all his people. There's no good thing that I hear my sons What meaneth this then, Saul? If you say you obeyed God, what you are, speak so loud that the world can't hear what you say. They're looking at your walk, not listening to your talk. They're judging by your actions every day. Don't believe you deceive by claiming what you've never known. They'll accept what they see and know you to be. They'll know you by your life. And so the third warning given to us from this sad record of Saul's life is that it is fearfully possible to claim and profess a life of obedience to God while we live in total defiance of his commandments, knowingly. It's possible. While they profess to know him, they deny him in their works. Titus 1 verse 16. People can profess to know God. But sadly, Saul's remorse, his sorrow, was through the fear of man, not of God. That is fearful. Sadly, his only remorse and sorrow was through the fear of man, not of God. His only concern was to save face before men. He begged Samuel to make a sacrifice to God with him publicly. He cried in 1 Samuel 15 verse 30, I've sinned, but honor me, I pray thee, I beg thee, before the elders of my people, before Israel, my people, turn with me again. Here we see another grave danger. It's possible that you know, to know that your life grieves God, but through pride, you attempt to put on a front 
to save face publicly, and from then onward to live, to be accepted by men only. Never for God. All that's in your heart is to lie and not be found out what you really are, the grief you really are to God and all. Imagine coming to church and professing Christ and living like that just for the eyes of men in fear of men to put on a front. And Saul, Saul was soon feared by all. Even Samuel, who delighted him in him, was fearful for his life. For when the Lord said unto Samuel, I will send thee to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided me, I found me a king among his sons. 1 Samuel 16 verse 1. Verse 2, Samuel said, how can I go? If Saul hear it, he will kill me. 1 Samuel 18 verse 15. And when Saul, when Saul saw that David, David behaved himself very wisely, that all Israel and Judah loved David, he was afraid of him. That is, he was threatened by him. Therefore Saul sought to kill him. 1 Samuel 19 says in verse 10, And David soon fearfully cried, There is but one step between me and death. Everyone feared Saul. 1 Samuel 20 verse 3, A few years ago, I was preaching here in the USA in a church, and there was a whole lot of young people in this one home, at least 10 young people, all professing to love God, zealous Bibles, had their quiet times all over the rooms. Yes, the one boy that was in this home was so zealous with his testimony and his prayers and his questioning, oh, he was zealous on fire. I even asked him to close one meeting in a very big church, his father's church. I asked him to close the prayer. So impressed. I was away. Suddenly the news came soon after that, very soon. And a message was sent to me that he was jailed for life for killing someone that was at that table with him who also delighted in God, it seemed. When I finally saw that man, the preacher, I said, why did he do that? Jealousy, Brother Keith. Jealousy can bring out the deepest evil a man is capable of committing. It is so evil. It was jealousy that made the Pharisees determined that Christ would die and wouldn't rest until he hung on that cross, till he was dead. Nothing else. Jealousy can make a man into an animal. Brother, if you are. And in 1 Samuel 26, verse 21, Saul eventually, sadly confessed in a brief moment, a brief moment of honest but shameful reflection. I have played the fool. A theatrical term for someone who takes the part of a foolish man. Perhaps there's some of us here tonight who also, through this message, are looking back shamefully and also crying, if only I hadn't played the fool with salvation, with God. Oh, what I could have been. A short while ago, well, 
two years maybe, a woman in America, in Washington, a very godly woman, phoned me back to the other side of the world, Cape Town, South Africa. She said, Brother Keith, I have been praying about you, deeply pray, deep prayer for you of late. I don't know why, brother, I read this passage in the scriptures this morning and everything in me cried, phone Keith Daniel and read it to him. And so she did. I trembled the way she read it with the anointing of God on this woman. I just trembled the way she read it for I'd never ever been gripped to that degree startled at these <laughs> Deuteronomy 20 verse 8 it shall come to pass if if thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God <coughs> to observe and to do all his commandments I sure knew this he knew these words and had heard it many times. Don't doubt this now. He knew this. If you do and obey his commandments, the Lord thy God will set thee on high. And all these blessings shall come on thee if, if thou should hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God. Blessed shalt thou be in the city. Blessed shalt thou be in the field. Blessed shalt be the fruit of thy body. Verse 5. Blessed <coughs> shall be thy basket in thy store. Blessed shalt thou be when thou comest in, when thou goest out. The Lord shall cause thine enemies that rise up against thee to be smitten before thy face. The Lord shall command his blessings upon thee. In the storehouses and all that thou settest thine hand unto, he will bless thee in this land. Verse 9, the Lord shall establish thee and holy people unto himself as he hath sworn unto thee. If, tragic word, if, so he knew it, if, he knew these words, if thou shalt keep the commandments of the Lord thy God and walk in his ways. And all the people of this earth shall see that thou art called by my name. They shall be afraid of thee. Verse 12, the Lord shall open unto thee his good treasure. Isn't that staggering what God holds out here? He shall bless all the work of thy hands. Verse 13, and the Lord shall make thee the head, not the tail. Thou shalt be above only, thou shalt not be beneath, if... Thou hearken unto the commandments of the Lord thy God. Verse 14, and thou shalt not go aside from any of the words which I command thee, to the right hand or to the left. Verse 15, but it shall come to pass, Saul, so not even you will I exclude everyone. thousand years later God was speaking to but it shall come to pass if thou wilt not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God to observe to do all his commandments and his statutes that all these curses shall come upon thee soul and everyone else who I look into every soul's heart cursed shall thou be in every way that he had mentioned he would bless the Lord shall send cursing upon thee that is vexation, trouble and confusion in all that thou settest thine hand to do the Lord shall smite thee with madness Confusion, that is astonishment of heart. Thou shalt not prosper in any of thy ways. Thou shalt only be oppressed. 
Thou shalt be mad, driven to madness because of the sins of your life in the sight of men who fear you when they once loved you. Thou shalt become an astonishment, a proverb, a byword in this world. Verse 44, all these curses shall come upon thee. They shall pursue thee and overtake thee. Now, perhaps, perhaps, this message is God's last call to you. You think that's not true? Perhaps God is crying out to you to get up and seek him with all your heart and soul like that young boy did. To get up and try again. Saul didn't. But you can, like Ahab did, etc. You still can cease to play the fool with God 